Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this morning's Sabbath school study. As we return to the conversation that we started this last week, as we look again at these verses from Ezekiel 33, shall we praise our Heavenly Father for his great blessings in allowing us time to understand what he is saying to us so that we may be more prepared in our own lives, in our own actions and our examples, to be able to share with others what it means to see and experience your character. Shall we now praise him together in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these opportunities we have to join together. We thank you for these opportunities we have to open your word so that our lives may be prepared to come into your presence. As we come into your presence now, we thank you and we praise you for all that you have been doing these last many weeks. We thank you for Theodore's safe return for all of us being able to join together, to come before you in spirit and in truth, to learn what it means to be guided by you. Help us now. May our characters become prepared to become more like you. We need you. We ask now for your blessing that you will send your spirit. We ask now, Father, as well, that your angels may surround us. Help us. May our minds be ready so that we might more, more clearly understand what is occurring as your spirit is poured out around us so that we may be prepared when your spirit is poured out upon us. Direct us now. Guide us, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. A very quick recap. We're going to go over two very very pertinent verses to everything we've been addressing and recap briefly where we were at at the end of last week's study. Ezekiel thirty-three twelve. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. For as the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all of his righteousnesses shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Now, as we were walking this through last week, we looked at the example of the prophet that is given for our admonition in 1 Kings 13. Now, this portion of Ezekiel and the witness in 1 Kings 13 are direct examples of the fallacy of once saved, always saved. Now, from last week's study, do we have any point, comment, thought, or question as to where we were addressing these items and how we were addressing them? Okay? From a non-published manuscript, Manuscript 57 of 1900, just before his ascension, Jesus gave the message to his disciples. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. There is truth to be received if souls are saved. The keeping of the commandments of God is life eternal to the receiver. But the scriptures make it plain that those 
who once knew the way of life and rejoiced in the truth are in danger of falling through apostasy and being lost. Therefore, there is need of a decided daily conversion to God. Any thoughts on this comment? Well, you know, since I, I was, I didn't actually watch your presentation from last Sabbath. Can you explain the context more of what, what it is we're studying, what it is we're trying to understand here? There were questions that were raised as we were going through these two verses in Ezekiel. And the basic question, I believe it was Brother Kelly that brought it up, being how could this be that someone that could serve God and yet commit a single sin, that they could be lost. Now, if I misunderstood what the point was, then that's my problem. Well, I, I don't, I don't understand this idea that okay, so somebody's righteous but he commits a single sin and is lost. I don't think that's how it works. Well, then, because if, if somebody's righteous, he's not going to commit a single sin, right? Like. That's, you know, it, I mean, none of us are righteous anyway. So, so I don't quite understand that. What does it mean to be righteous? Well, it means to do righteousness. What does it mean to be righteous, though? Well, it would be the same thing. To be righteous, you would have to do righteousness. But the, wouldn't it mean in this that those that are and become righteous have confronted and struggled against sin. Yeah, so they've overcome sin. The righteous in the end overcomes sin. So somebody who's righteous isn't going to turn from his righteousness in that context, right? Um, I mean, here, when they're talking about righteousness, he, he's talking about it in, in sort of a, a different context, right? So he's talking about people who, who, you know, are doing the right thing, so to speak. This isn't really about Christ's righteousness here, right? It's just saying that we need to be careful just because we're following God now doesn't mean that if we uh, turn away from God that we can count on what's happened before, right? So so there's a whole context here that's a little bit different. You can't You can't take this context and put it in the context. You know, just straight away, you can understand what's being talked about here. Um, because this is, is addressing uh, the house of Israel and that he is telling them to turn away from their wickedness. Right. So because they're going to have their city destroyed. Or actually, they have had their city oh, destroyed at this point, Ezekiel 33. So, so he's, so after they have had the cities destroyed, now, um, there's a call to repentance. So I think I the think context of my... What's that? I think the con. I think the context of my question, if I, what prompted the thought or the question, I was reading something. Um, it was how one decision can have eternal consequences. How we can, uh, and she mentions. D.M. Canwright making a shipwreck of his faith. And then in that description, she describes how one choice can make us lost. I guess it's the idea. It's not one sin so much as it is turning away from, from God, from walking in righteousness. Like there comes a time, a line or something that only God knows. Is there a line? There's a line somewhere yeah. where God realizes the person has no more opportunity, will not. God knows they will not uh, turn back. Well, God reads the heart. So in the end, in the great right. controversy, yeah. right? So we have where people have made their choice in the brightest of light that can be given to mankind. When the wicked are declared wicked at the close of probation, they're not going to turn from their wickedness. And when the righteous are declared righteous, they're not going to turn from their righteousness. Now, that is that demonstration 
is why God can then declare uh, people who have very little opportunity, like babies, you know, or people that just had had very little light. God can read the heart and say, this person will be in the kingdom. And other people that we might even consider righteous, God will say, no, they're not going to be in the kingdom. So God, we can trust that God's ability to assess the, the spiritual condition, the heart of the individual is accurate. So that, that's why we need this final demonstration. Because otherwise God can't close up history. It, it, there wouldn't be the security that's needed. So this whole point of the judgment is, is so that we can have confidence in what God is doing. God isn't going to just arbitrarily pick people who are going to be in heaven and reject people who aren't. You know, that type of predestination that you see in Calvinism. God just chooses some people to be righteous and he just makes them righteous and some people to be wicked and he just makes them wicked. Right. So well, well, we see that God is both just and a justifier of them that believeth in Christ. I was thinking, uh, well, when we, when you mentioned that a righteous person will not sin, amen. And that, when we get to that point in our lives where we would rather die than commit a known sin and search in our hearts for unknown sins, even that, that is when the see a person who has been sealed, when we are sealed, we will, we will not turn back. And it's not because we can't, but because we won't. So it's the sealing that's, that seals us in that experience, I guess. Mm -hmm. Does that sound yeah. Yeah, but see, there to me seems to just always be this misunderstanding about uh, like these types of verses that we see in Scripture. We see something similar in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, where it talks about, uh, let me see here, that's always misunderstood. I think it's chapter 10, or is it chapter 12? I always forget where it is. Yeah, it's chapter 10, where it talks about the full assurance of faith. Um you know, having therefore, brethren, starting at verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath despite unto the Spirit of grace? So often what we do is we take this statement out of its context. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now Paul here is talking about under the old covenant, under Moses' law, right? That is, in Moses' law, if you did willful or known sin, there's actually no sacrifices that you can do. Remember when David committed murder and adultery. He says, if there was a sacrifice that I could give, I would give it, right? So there, there was no sacrifices that he could give to, to cover his sin of murder and adultery. But he says, a broken and a contrite heart, thou wilt not despise. So, so when we have this certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, that's actually under Moses' law, Right? And, and if we reject the, 
you know, the blood of Christ, his, the only remedy for sin, then that's, that's going to be much worse punishment than what Moses law gave. So, uh, the point, the point that I'm making here is that when we look at this passage in Ezekiel, there's a certain context. So we, we sometimes take these statements in scripture. We pull them out of their context and we try to apply them. I remember when I, when I'd first gone to, it must have been like one of the first sermons I ever heard in, uh, Central Church, Edmonton Central, when, after I was baptized. Um, cause I remember I was sitting up in the balcony. And that's where I first sat. Um, cause I went to that, the youth group was up there senior youth but anyway uh the sermon had to do with something like well it wasn't a sermon it was actually it might have been the youth somebody in the youth doing something uh the idea was it was it was kind of a play right so i was pretty disgusted with it i thought it was ridiculous but this idea of that was presented and i, I don't remember all the details so i'm going to do a bad job but here's my impression of it is this idea that there's this good Seventh-day Adventist and what happens if they, you know, happen to go out with some friends, uh, they get drunk, you know, and then they, uh, you know, they, they get killed in a car wreck, you know, are they going to be lost, right? And so there's this, to me, it's just like nonsense. It's not how God works. He's not like, you're good and all of a sudden you 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 trip up and then you're going to have your probation closed at that time and then you're lost forever right god doesn't judge people that way you know so first if that person is um getting drunk and getting killed at that time i mean god will have closed their probation but for a reason not just because of that one act right if they're lost, it's not because of some single act that, you know, you just happen to die at that moment that you're you're committing a sin. And if, you know, if they had, you know, lived 20 minutes longer and repented and then died, they would have been saved. Right. You understand what I'm saying? OK, so. The question that I have to then ask of you. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we reconcile this with First Kings 13? Okay, so in First Kings, okay, you're you're talking about um, the Jeroboam. I'm speaking of the prophet that was sent with the curse of the altar. Okay, yeah. that was given a very specific admonition as to what he was to do. Right. So, so he's in complete disobedience to God. So. So you're saying because he's a prophet, he's righteous. And then because he done, did this one sin, now he's lost. Well, and, what, and if he hadn't, and if he had lived. So my point is, if he had died before he, he had gone to, uh, to speak to Jeroboam, if he's lost, he would have been lost before, right? That is, it's not like, you're saved or lost based upon a single act, right? We're, we're lost because of our sins. Every one of us is lost because of our sins. That if, if all we have is our record of our life, none of us have hope. None of us have, none of us have a, a, um, a ticket into heaven. So, so we have to be cleansed from our sins. It has to be Christ's righteousness. So, yes, this guy sinned, but if he had been obedient to God, um, so we, we don't know his heart. All we know is the whole story. But if he's lost, he's lost not because of this one act, right? I, re I remember re reading about no sacrifice, uh, that verse, and, and living in quite a bit of fear. But, I mean, we may not be lost because of a misstep or a mistake or whatever. Mm -hmm. But Jesus, if he had committed one sin, we would all be lost. So what's the difference there? <laughs> well, because he's the Savior. Okay. So, yeah, we're not. 
we're the same. Okay. Yeah, yeah Ellen White pretty says, simple difference. Yeah, because yeah, Ellen White makes a statement in this regard. It's not, I, I can't remember her exact words. Um, I, I, I believe there's misstep in there. Uh, can I ask a question, Theodore? Yeah. It, say, say, if I went out here and I know it is wrong to rob a bank, and I go out here and I go out here and rob a bank, and then process the robbing that bank, I die in that sin. Then, then I, then I would not be in heaven, right? Yeah, but, but that's that. Be, yes, you would not probably not be in heaven. I mean. You're right. a sinner who's because I knew I was knew it was wrong to do right. Well, we had to know we had to know we had to know that it's wrong. Yeah, and see, this is know. such wrong thinking. I don't know why we have this thinking in the first place. So let's look at a few spirit of prophecy quotes. Well, we know that we can't we can't indulge in sin, right? You know, Ellen White says one from conscience. The indulgence of one evil ha habit. O okay, one safeguard removed from conscience. The indulgence of one evil habit. A single neglect of high claims of duty may be the beginning of a course of deception that will pass you into the ranks of those who are serving Satan. While you are all the time professing to love God and his cause. A moment of thoughtlessness, a single misstep may turn the whole current of your lives in the wrong direction, and you may never know what caused your ruin until the sentence is pronounced, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So, yes, we know that we, we, can't, we can't lightly look at any sin, right? Because those sins can start us down a course just in, uh, if we think about a stream, right? A stream can change course if it's allowed uh, to go one way, just a little bit of a stream, it can cut and change course. In the mountains, we see this all the time. Backpacking, you'll see bridges crossing uh, a dry stream bed um, because the stream has changed course and they have to build another bridge over in a, another part. So so we understand the, the dangers of sin, but there is another stat statement, okay. that's sort of what I would call a balancing statement. Okay, but we're before... talking about the tenor of the life, um, and and you see how they go together. What's that, Dwight? Okay, to to place what you're what what you're referring to in context, I'm looking at testimony for the church number thirty two, which was placed into an omnibus edition of five testimonies three ninety seven. Yeah, I'm looking now, at that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> The paragraph as it reads in Testimony 32. Our great adversary has agents that are constantly hunting for an opportunity to destroy souls as a lion hunts its prey. Shun them, young man, for while they appear to be your friends, they will slyly introduce evil ways and practices. They flatter you with their lips and offer to help and guide you, but their steps take hold on hell. If you listen to their counsel, it may be the turning point in your life. One safeguard removed from conscience, the indulgence of one evil habit, a single neglect of the high claims of duty, may be the beginning of a course of deception that will pass you into the ranks of those who are serving Satan. While you are all the time professing to love God, and his cause. A moment of thoughtlessness, a single misstep, may turn the whole current of your lives in the wrong direction. And you may never know what caused your ruin until the sentence is pronounced, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, this particular type of, of thought is repeated six times during the life of Mrs. White, because we have it in the testimonies, we have it in gospel workers, we have it in manual for canvassers, and we have it in a, a manuscript that was published in 1899. 
So it's just a singular statement, but it's republished in different forms. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I read from. Right. So I was reading part of that. Right. So so we know that we can't we can't sin and 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 do that safely because it, it can cause a complete change of life. Now I'm trying to find the other statement though. Um I when uh, it says making one choice can change the whole course of our life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I definitely experienced that about three years ago. I I was like pretty far out there running as hard as I could from God because of one choice that started the whole chain. Mm -hmm. In a situation like, like that, the rejoicing that I would have is that you saw that a choice led to you running from God, but yet again, you have returned I don't know I, I don't know all of your heart, brother, but the time that we have spent together, I have understood a lot of your struggles. And I rejoice in the fact that you are here. I rejoice in the fact that you are not only giving testimony, but you are giving witness to the power of God to be able to save utterly. When we were addressing this last week, and I was using the example of this prophet, yes, God does use humans that are weak because we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of God's glory. This prophet was given an admonition. He was given instruction from God. Here is the work you are to do. He followed that word of God. He followed it directly. When the king made the offer for him to dine with the king, he turned the king down. Yet when another that identified himself as a prophet made the offer, this man that turned down the king was willing to set aside the word of God and eat with this this other man. Thereby it led to his destruction. We cannot in any regard turn away from what God has presented in his word. By his word, I mean from the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy. Now, Mrs. White is very direct. All who seek to sustain the doctrine of election... Do this against a plane, thus saith the Lord. I have a friend of long standing that has chosen to accept the Calvinist doctrines. He believes that he is of the elect and that his election is sure, that his salvation is certain, no matter what he does. And I have been very sad because I know that even though he lives as a very good person, that there are many things that he has chosen to reject, and he's rejecting these against scripture, against spirit of prophecy, because he believes he is of the elect. And this this doctrine of predestination, which is what election is, and um, once saved, all, always saved, are species right. of the same um, error. Right. Right. And this is this is my point: is that I think we fall into a trap sometimes on this issue with because God never closes a person's probation arbitrarily. Right. You would agree with that. Agreed. Yeah. So. So when he has made a decision about a person, when a person's probation has closed, when a person person dies, uh, God already knows the destiny of that person before that person's even born, right? He allows people to live out their life as part of the plan of salvation, of allowing people uh, 
that he has clearly given an opportunity to every man to choose righteousness. And, and we can't see all of that behind the scenes. So in our, in our view, we could say, well, there was this righteous person. He did one sin and then he died, so he's lost. But God has already known that situation, that if that person had continued to live, he would not have been righteous, right? And, and maybe even somebody who, that we don't see ever that they did some sin. But God, they're not going to be in God's kingdom because God knows if they had continued to live, that because that, he can read the heart, we can't. Right. So to me, it's 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 sort of this we get caught in this silly trap of of judging before the time. That is, God is the one that is the judge. Now, the point of this is that Ellen White is using. She's saying that this is against the doctrine of election, because in the doctrine of election, they're teaching that there's two groups, righteous and wicked, and that the righteous are elected by God. And so they really can't do anything wrong. And that the wicked are are chose, chosen to be lost, and and they really can't do anything, you know, to change that, right? Okay. Right. So, so Ellen White's using the statement to show that that there isn't this fixed thing of righteous and wicked. That he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous, as it says in First John. Right. That we, we need to recognize that there is no safety for those that participate in sin. It's Satan's ground. It's dangerous. It's a deception. And, and we have to choose to do righteousness. But we can't we can't make the mistake of thinking just because somebody is righteous, quotation marks, um, that they truly are righteous. God is the one who judges the heart. And in, in our own experience, we're going to see ourselves as unrighteous and depend upon Christ's righteous, righteousness. And that's why it says, uh, if you trust in his own righteousness and commit iniquity, noticing that when we trust in our own righteousness, we will sin. Right. So our righteousness has to be in Christ. We don't see ourselves as righteous, right? And um, that that's mm-hmm. kind of a a road. It's kind of a kind of a road that some people have gone down, where we only have so long to stop sinning, and then it's going to be the close of probation. And somehow they think that they're safe now because they they've reached that point in their life where they are sealed. But we, yeah. I don't know. It, it, it's it's an unconscious process almost. Like God working in us to do that which we can't. Um, yeah, our responsibility is to see ourselves as sinners and to depend upon Christ's righteousness and to choose to always do righteousness and never make an excuse for sin. That's our responsibility. But as far as declaring us righteous, that's God's responsibility. It's not something that we can do. We we can't judge our own hearts in that sense. Because if we look at Christ which is what we're supposed to do. We will see ourselves as unrighteous because in comparison to Christ, we always are. The righteous don't see themselves as righteous. If you see yourself as righteous, the one thing you can be certain of is that you're laid to see it because they see themselves as righteous. So we need to recognize our, our sin and depend upon Christ's righteousness. So, so to, to me, that's really you know, the point of, of all this. But, uh, the parable that sums that up for me is the, what is it, the, fair, the, the one who stands on the corner and prays, and then there's the poor man who can't lift his head. Yeah, the Pharisee. He was right. The Pharisee Fair, in the yeah, yeah. Perfect uh, parable to sum that up. Yeah, I, I did a sermon on that one time. It was the shortest sermon I ever did. Did they remove you? <laughs> no, no, it's People just rise that, up that not much to say. <laughs> it is kind of, <laughs> you know, I just kind of read the verse, commented on it a little bit, and, and then I was done. Because it, it, I mean, it's a pretty clear uh, message, um, you know, that the one who's going to be 
justified is the one that says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The one who compares himself with others and thinks he's righteous, he's not going to go down to his house justified, but is made righteous. But so so we have here this 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 idea. Right. So we know that we can't safely commit sin and that we're going to see ourselves as sinners. But we can understand the promises of God of what he's going to do in our lives. And and so we can know that in spite of how we see ourselves, that God can save us. And maybe because we can see ourselves as sinners, because we've come to Christ, God will save us, but not based upon anything in us that makes us better than anyone else. Um, and when you don't have that balance of these two ideas, you have those that say, oh, you know, we're just in Christ, we're made righteous, and don't worry about your sins. That's more spending, right? You know, there's a, a truth to that, but if it's taken out of its context, then it becomes error. Or or those that focus upon, well, you can't do commit any sin, you gotta be really, really careful. But never understand uh, Christ's power to forgive that the word that it's his righteousness, you know, who who become, you know, steeped in what we generally would describe as legalism. Right. That they're trying to see themselves as righteous. Those two things go hand in hand. Ellen White says all error is truth taken out of its context and brought to an extreme. Right. So. So we, we need to put this in, in its proper context. Anyway, so thanks for clarifying that, Dwight. Okay. So Ezekiel 18.21. In Ezekiel we read, If the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep, my, keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. When I say to the righteous, that he shall surely live if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity. All his righteousnesses shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. This is plain, decided Bible truth. Again, in <clears throat> what, what I have been using as a reference from 1 Kings 13, here we have a man He's given an admonition. The Lord tells him exactly what he's to do. He goes, he does what he's told to do. The king makes an offer, come dine with me. And he turns the king down. He won't drink water with him. He won't have a morsel of bread, nothing. Yet another says, I'm also a prophet, come with me. And he chooses to set aside the word of the Lord. And he was then, then he died. Let every soul be careful how he shall conduct himself after he has made his profession before many witnesses. Are we taking the name of the Lord in vain when we make a profession to believe God and accept his word and then go off and do exactly as we please. Who are these witnesses? Who, what witnesses are being referred to here? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all the heavenly universe are witnesses of that burial in water in the likeness of Christ's death. Those who have been truly converted have been buried with Christ in the likeness of his death and raised from the watery grave in the likenesses of his resurrection to walk in the newness of life. By careful obedience to the truth, these are making their calling and their election sure. Now, Ezekiel 33, 14. And when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, or as the margin reading would say, and do judgment and justice, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he hath robbed, 
walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Now, Mrs. White continues here from letter 20 of 1889. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This promise is oft repeated. 1 John 1, 9, which is very interesting because symbolically could we not see that this is also a call at 9, 11. Here again is a conditional promise. Will we claim it? You need wisdom that you may not err in your confession of sins. Jesus, your Savior, is to be your confessor. There are some sins that are to be confessed to men. If we have wronged another, we are to make confession to him. Have we injured or defrauded our neighbor? We should not only confess the sin, but make restitution. The work which you have to do on your part is plainly set before you. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evils of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he hath robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, and he, he shall not die. What else do we see here? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by what else. What we see is um, that this is the work that we are to do. This is the, the life of the Christian. Because how we came to Christ at the beginning is how we come to him every day. Okay. So, so we have to do righteousness, right? We have to be cleansed of our sins. We have to, you know, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead the widow. We have to uh, recognize as sins uh, become, we become aware of sins in our lives. We have to forsake those sins and make restitution. I mean, this is AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, this is what a person does who is seeking to recover from the sin that has uh, held them captive. Okay. Now, she continues. It, uh, Dwight, yes, sir. I just wanted to add to Theodore's comment there that the 12 steps of AA... I actually have a study guide for Steps to Christ that follows those 12 steps through the book. Um, and the first three are basically righteousness by faith. I can't, God can, I'll let him. That's the shortened vi ver version of it. You know, came, uh, yeah, I can't, God can, I'll let him. And the one theater was speaking to, there's a couple of them, made a list of those we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them when to do so would not cause harm. Sometimes it can cause harm. It's an interesting. Okay, the question, the question from the chat, and thank you, Kelly. Question from the chat, is the pledge to be restored, renewing our covenant with God to be faithful to him? How would you see that? How would you answer that question? Well, well, the pledge is normally uh, referred to a pledge to God. That's a promise that that has to be restored. Um, so I think that's what it's referring to is our the covenant with God. That's the way I would take it. But I mean, there is, in a sense, two things that we have promised other people. Uh, those also need to be uh, restored. Okay. Is it? Is that the idea of, uh, oh shoot, lost my train of thought. Well, we have to take um, the responsibilities for things that are a responsibility. You can't just become a Christian and then ignore your responsibilities. I was thinking of the covenant and that 
that the Israelites made with God, everything the Lord has said we will do. And God mm -hmm. is faithful to his covenant. He is faithful, but he knows that we're not. So it's God that keeps the covenant through well, imparting righteousness. Is that? Well, but, there, but the covenant is the two-way street. I mean, obviously we know that it's based upon God's promises, not man's promises, right, of what God's going to do. That's the new covenant. The old covenant was all the Lord has said we will mm -hmm. do and be obedient. The new covenant is based upon God's promises of what he's going to do in us. But there still is a response to that, right? Yeah, so, of course. I'm Right. Just, I'm, I'm just saying when I see myself, I'm just saying when I when I see myself failing in that that I my my only hope is in God. When I see myself failing, so mm -hmm. I turn to Him in that covenant. I like what you you said there about uh, the sacrifice of a contrite and broken heart or spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are the sacrifices that that God accepts, and that's the sacrifice of the new covenant. I think is that. Uh, Connect, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yielding to God, asking Him to do what we can do. Now there is things that we can do, right? Like in the Laodicean message, Ellen White says, you know, Christ is standing at the door, knocking at our heart. Uh, we can't clean up everything, but we can remove the rubbish from the door to allow Him entrance. And so we need God in our lives, right? He wants to do a work in us, and he won't do it against our will. So if, yeah, so if we look at this part of it, I mean, our responsibility is to connect to God. He's there knocking, and we need to, we need to seek him. But, and, we, and we can't fall into the error of, well, because Christ is my Savior and he's going to take care of everything that I don't need to worry about my sins. I mean, we obviously need to address the sin problem every day. Um, sin is sin. And and it can bar us from heaven if we cling to that sin rather than let go of it. You know, we all know the story of the raccoon, you know, puts his hand in a jar, you know, to get something. And, you know, he he won't let go. Right. I don't know if it's a true story or not, but, uh, you know, we, we sometimes have to let go of our sin if we're going to be saved. I mean, we have to let go. If not sometimes we do. Uh, but sometimes we cling to that. We want that and to be saved. And you can't have both. These next two paragraphs are worthy of consideration. The Lord declares the children of thy people say the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel. Is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? And not that he should return from his ways and live. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Therefore turn yourselves and live ye. Ezekiel eighteen twenty five, twenty three, thirty, and 32. Here the Lord has plainly revealed his will concerning the salvation of the sinner. And the attitude which many assume in expressing doubts and unbelief as to whether the Lord will save them is a reflection upon the character of God. Those who complain of his justice and severity are virtually saying the way of the Lord is not equal. But he distinctly throws back the imputation upon the sinner. Your ways are not equal. Can I pardon your transgressions when you do not repent and re and turn from your sins? Let's consider this. As we're coming to the close of our time together, 
how can God, how can our Heavenly Father pardon our transgressions if we do not choose to repent, if we do not choose to turn away from our sins, cultivated and inherited? What are we to do? Any comment or thought? Been reading about the work, the great work of God, and what our work is, and what our message is, and it's a message of repentance and God's mercy. That that seems to be the message we need to be able to display or demonstrate in our lives: repentance and calling men to repentance. And that experience, so they can have that experience of righteousness themselves. I mean, all the other things, the, the prophecies and so on. Yeah, they're important. And prophecy is actually a message of repentance in a, in a way. So, yeah, that seems seems to sum up our message for to me. Our message being. Uh, the final generation or the people who demonstrate before the world and call them call the world to repentance everyone without yeah without being a guy standing on the street corner being odd but yeah our life our life can can be a call to repentance to people when when i see people in the church i've seen what I believe, sanctified saints. I mean, the light of heaven is on their countenance. Uh, generally older folk who have some experience and they're calm, peaceful, and powerful in their simple words, the way they speak them. I think that's, yeah, I'm done. Brothers and sisters, for this next week, let's consider that if we're thinking that the ways of God are not equal, that some have it easier than others. Let's accept the fact that our ways are not equal. If we're going to be looking to be unified, we need our sins to be pardoned by God. There are some that are transgressions against our brothers and sisters. For those, we need to repent. For those, we need to confess, we need to turn from our sins so that we can be forgiven and we can accept it within our own lives. Because without this, and we have the example of what occurred at Pentecost to back this thought up, without this, the Holy Spirit cannot be poured out. We are delaying the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Any other thought, comment, or question at this time? Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you that we may come before you so that we may indeed be forgiven of our sins. Help us to let go of our sins. Guide us in all things so that that which is done may be done to your glory. Direct us now. Be with us, we ask. Help us so that we may directly let go of that which has been held in our lives for far too long. May your will be done. May we surrender all to you. Help us to this end. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.